You know, um, the title of my uh, talk tells you what I'm going to say. I'm actually a tech guy. I, um, for the most of my life, I used to be a computer programmer, a nerd, a geek, who uh, eventually made it up to vice president to build some great technology. By accident, I became um, an entrepreneur. And I never looked back. Entrepreneurship was in my blood. So I started building companies, doing a lot of great stuff. And then I had some health problems. I had to switch gears and become an academic. So when I became an academic, I started researching topics um, which were surprising to me, like um, engineering education in India and China. I was no expert on that. But, but there were so many myths in, in, in America that I started researching that. I started researching uh, what was happening overseas, globalization, US competitiveness. And somewhere along the way, way people started thinking I was a guru on US competitiveness, because I was talking about all the advances that are happening in other countries. The question I get, kept getting back was, well, how should the US compete? Switch gears, started looking at entrepreneurship, and I published several papers on entrepreneurship. I started looking at um, immigration. I started looking at um, what are called clusters and um, university research, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, the sticky thing was when I started looking at entrepreneurship and immigration, I found some very interesting data about Silicon Valley that over a period of 20 or 30 years, it transformed itself. That Annalie Saxon, who's the dean of information systems at Berkeley, had documented in the 90s that a quarter of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by people like me, Indians and Chinese, typically. I did an update of her research and looked about 15 years later. We found was that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by people like me, foreigners, foreign, foreign born, which is just amazing. And what we found also was that um, Indians were the dominant uh, players in that. Look at this chart over here. That's the birthplace of founders of Silicon Valley startups. They're from all over the world. Now, Indians are a dominant uh, force over here, but they come from everywhere. Right? I mean, almost every country is represented on this, uh, on this chart. So when you look at it, it really looks like the United Nations, doesn't it? I mean, meritocracy, and I'm going to show you the definition of meritocracy, but if this isn't a, isn't a meritocracy, what is? If a person like me can come here and make it big, why can't anyone? Right? Indeed, I started looking into um, why Indians have been successful. How do they go from, um, from being 0% of Silicon Valley startups <laughs> to being 15.5 hour tech firms? That's little Apu. I mean, he's the, uh, the stereotype. <laughs> because a lot of what happens in, um, in society is based on stereotypes. That's how you judge people. I put him up there on purpose. Okay. And Indians in particular, uh, when I was a kid in, the, uh, in New York City growing up, uh, people used to, I, I still have vivid memories of that. People would tell uh, their uh, children to eat their food and think about the starving uh, you know, uh, people in India before they waste it. That's what used to be common in America. We were beggars and snake charmers. Look at us today. Today, I write about immigration, and I get death threats from these wackos who blame uh, my people for taking their jobs away. Right? So us beggars and snake charmers are taking American jobs away. And this is why I get attacked by left, right, and center these, uh, on the extreme. But that's how much uh, things changed. So I came here about two, two years ago to uh, Silicon Valley because I was researching uh, what makes Silicon Valley tick. And this question about why are Indians successful kept haunting me because there was no easy explanation. How do people like me literally come to the most innovative, most entrepreneurial land in the world and become so successful? 6% of its population founding 15.5% of its tech firms. It doesn't add up. How can, you, how can that be? Right? So this is what I was uh, researching. And what I learned basically was that Indians had built networks, that they mastered the valley's rules of engagement. And they learned, they learned how it works. And, and they started helping each other. And that's how they achieved success. They formed networks. There were several Indian networks where people started helping each other, giving back, pulling others behind them. And that's how this entire, you know, uh, this, this entire uh, group of people rose above and succeeded. And look at us now. I mean, I have friends who live in obscenely beautiful houses here in the valley. I mean, uh, $50 million, $100 million residences. And they drive around in fancy cars. And they're a bunch of Indians who came from India very poor. So this is the magic of Silicon Valley. So look at uh, uh, the definition of meritocracy. Doesn't Silicon Valley look like a meritocracy? Surely it does. And this is what my impression was when I came over here that Silicon Valley is the world's greatest meritocracy. If you read some of my articles, 
You'll see I actually said that several times. This is, the, you know, anyone can succeed over here. It's a great place and so on. Until my wife and I started uh, uh, frequenting some of the popular events of Silicon Valley. For example, we went to one event called the Crunchies about two years ago. I used to write for a tech blog called TechCrunch. And we went there, and it was a great event. I, we were sit, literally we were sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg. And I was sitting there, wow, wow. You know, it, was, it was a big deal for us to have come here and have all these celebrities we read about all over there. And about half an hour, 45 minutes into the program, my wife says to me, Tavinda, she says, Vivek, did you notice something strange? I said, yeah, I mean, Zuckerberg is sitting next to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, 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 no. She said, D -d look around. What do you see? I see, I, I see a bunch of uh, you know, white nerds. That's what I said to her. And what I noticed was that there were very few Indians and Chinese in the TechCrunch event. She says, no, look at the sex of them. There are no women here. And that was shocking to me. And then we, we started watching what was happening on stage. The entire event, there were probably 150 uh, you know, people on stage, mostly white young males, uh, and some old VCs who were you know, showing off about the fact that they'd invested in these young white males. <laughs> but uh, there were no women. There were two women, in fact. To be, to be clear, there were two women on stage. One is Heather Hardy, the CEO of TechCrunch. And the other one was a circus performer. She was part of a circus act. <laughs> There were no women on stage. I came back and sent emails to, uh, to Heather and to Mike saying, what's going on here? Why weren't there any women on stage? They got extremely defensive. I said, uh-huh, something is going on over here. I started getting all because Mike Arrington doesn't respond to emails. The guy's so arrogant that uh, he doesn't believe he has to respond. But suddenly, I was getting responses from him every five minutes. And then same with Heather Hardy. They started digging up all sorts of data to silence me. I said, something is wrong over here. Um, I started looking at the data. And the data were shocking. That um, according to one analysis, I saw only 3% uh, of the uh, you know, value stack firms were women. I started looking at the uh, uh, websites of some of the top companies. No women. Look at Apple. Not one woman anywhere in the management team, executive team. You know, I, uh, everyone worships Steve Jobs. And I, used to, you know, I, um, I think very highly of him, and it, I, I mourn his loss. But the fact is, he was a sexist. That's the reality. There were no women in his management team. So this is what uh, really opened my eyes. And um, I started talking to women. I mean, this, this is from Shahiroz Charnia from uh, Women 2.0. I asked her to give me some data on what uh, her group is seeing. And Women 2.0 is an amazing group. I think the world of her and her group. And she, sent me, you know, she let me share her, uh, these, uh, these slides. I was very sensitive about it. I didn't want to embarrass her. But she said, no, you can go ahead and, and uh, share what I said to you. I asked her, what do her, uh, the women in her group say? And you know, read these questions. I almost feel embarrassed to repeat them. The questions that women are asked by venture capitalists is, when are you going to have kids? Why isn't he the CEO? So what if your husband has to move? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I mean, these are the type of you know, um, comments that women hear. And I spoke to dozens of women at this stage to validate that. All the, I'm sorry, dozens of women that I could find. You don't find many women in Silicon Valley. But it was a common theme that I heard over and over again. And one of our close friends is uh, Vinita Gupta. She was a really hotshot CEO. And you know, read her experience. She actually, actually had, wrote, had, had to write her experience for Business Week, uh, write a, a column which, which she documented her own uh, experience in raising funding. She was talking to me about the humility she felt in being pregnant. Why should she have to apologize for being pregnant? She'd been a very successful executive. She had bootstrapped her uh, a fantastic company, which she later uh, took public and made a gazillion dollars on it. But she was intimidated. She was terrified. She was apologetic for her for the fact that she had a baby. That's, so she went through a, a traumatic period uh, raising capital. She says she had some very good venture capitalists, and everything was OK. But this was a big red flag for me. So I wrote a piece in, uh, in TechCrunch. Silicon Valley, you and your uh, VCs have a gender problem. This provoked a firestorm like I've never seen. <laughs> I get death threats for writing about immigration from the, from the wackos, from the extremists. You understand them because they're not educated. They're you know, typically middle-aged uh, people whose skills are out of date, and they blame foreigners for losing their jobs. It, you can't blame them for, for blaming others because they're you know, in bad shape. But the type of emails I was getting from people in the venture capital community, the type of comments I was reading, the, the buzz I was seeing in the background, stunned me. 
Is this guy trying to get laid? What's his agenda? I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I was. This is my friends telling me what their partners were saying. And trust me, I know uh, who's with the venture community. I was absolutely blown away. Now, this is on the record. This is uh, on Twitter. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, now every time I write an article on on immigration, uh, sorry, every time I write an article about women, I know predictably that within three weeks, I'm going to have a bunch of uh, the you know the old white boys club attack me relentlessly for my, my, my uh, qualifications as an academic, my data, everything I've ever done in life is bad. But this is the type of uh, uh, you know, Twitter uh, uh, war that I have to endure, endure. You know, I thought I was coming to the wild, wild west where it was the white guys, the cowboys who had uh, arrows in their back. I'm the Indian with arrows in his back <laughs> because I've been so vocal about women. But this is the sad reality of Silicon Valley. So this is not, now, now let me go to Boston. This is uh, John Backus, uh, the magic founding um, uh, managing partner of New Atlantic Ventures. Actually, he's based in Virginia. He wrote a piece for PE Hub, which was the number one most read on PE Hub for 12 days in a row, in which he cited uh, some data I had written in an article for the Washington Post about the myths in entrepreneurship. And one of the myths I cited was that women can't cut it in the tech world. He went off in the deep end. Just read his comments. He went on about how I've never discriminated against women. This guy just made it up. He, he, doesn't, he's, uh, he just doesn't have any qualifications. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, he, he made it up. I'm offended for the fact that Vivek said that women can cut in the tech world and that they have a hard time in getting in front of um, uh, investors. So this is the type of uh, uh, you know, mindset that pervades, that permeates Silicon Valley. This is common. And like I said, I, I never expected I'd be here. I, I used to be a tech guy who was writing code. I never expected I'd be a professor at six universities um, and, you know, uh, writing uh, about uh, the issue of women. I didn't even know there was a problem with, with women. So much so, when I did my research, I didn't even have an, um, a sex as one of the questions I had in my research, which I'm going to go through now. So what I did was that after all this happened, I, uh, I had done extensive research on entrepreneurship. I went and reverse engineered my, web, my research. We, had, we went and checked the sex of the founders of, in certain studies we'd done to start comparing the difference between men and women. This is a, a complex chart, but essentially, um, the reasons for starting businesses were practically the same. Sources of funding, practically the same. Perceived challenges, practically the same. In fact, I had uh, the folks from NC Wit help me with this research. And when Joanne Cohoon first sent me back the analysis, I said, Joanne, I don't know what I'm going to report. There's no paper here. It's like one line. There's no difference between men and women. What are we going to publish? I went back to Kauffman Foundation, and they did a statistical analysis as well. They said, you know, this is worthy of publishing that there's no difference between men and women. So we looked for the, for the fine points, the fine differences between men and women. So we sort of had to make the most of the little differences we saw. It was minor things like women are more likely to have had uh, a business part of their partner that funded, funded, funded them and that they felt more pressure to maintain a steady traditional job. Yeah, right, so big, big deal. The bottom line was that no matter which way I sliced the data, we could not find a difference between men and women, men and women entrepreneurs. So why this big ruckus about women can't cut in the tech world? You know, if you go back and read TechCrunch, Mike Harrington went off the deep end after I, I published this. He attacked me like you won't believe. And he actually uh, found one woman to write an article saying women want to have babies, therefore they don't want to. Uh, uh, yeah, almost any woman that would say anything bad about women, they put on a stage on TechCrunch to sort of counter Vivek's propaganda. That's, that's literally what uh, these people were saying. So this is um, um, eye-opening. And then another thing happened to me. My, one of my uh, most brilliant Duke students wrote to me saying she was looking for a job in Silicon Valley. Look at her qualifications. I introduced her to several venture capitalists over here. She should have had a no j uh, problem getting a dozen job offers here. There's a shortage of engineers. This is a black woman engineer who could not get a job. She still lives on, on the East Coast. This was another red flag for me, saying, what's going on here? Where are the blacks? Again, if you look around, you know, I talk about women having it back, but it's even worse for blacks and Hispanics that they don't exist. In fact, until uh, a few months ago, I didn't know any black women CEOs in, in Silicon Valley. I didn't know they existed. Now I do know a couple of great women CEOs. But the fact is that you know, the, you know, all the data shows that we have a severe, severe problem over here. This doesn't look like a meritocracy to me. 
why is this important? Because this is what I keep getting asked over and over again from men who challenge uh, my, uh, my outspokenness. Because it's all about diversity. I mean, the data that uh, Cindy Padnos produced showed that women-led uh, companies are more efficient. They produce higher ROEs. You know, we graduate as many women as men. All the data shows that there's no disadvantage that women should have. It's not hard to fix it. Okay. How are you going to fix it? First of all, you have to admit there's a problem. I've taken fire from women as, from, from, as well as from men, by the way, because women believe that uh, those who are uh, uh, very vocal about it have a chip on their shoulder. And you know something? Almost all the women that have been attacking me are young, pretty women. So uh, you know, this is another, another problem over here, that there are a number of women who deny that there's a problem. And I've been attacked for being condescending, for, uh, for creating problems where there shouldn't be problems. The fact is that before you can fix a problem, you have to admit it exists. There is a problem over here. And I'm an Indian guy with no background in any of this, you know, completely clueless, ignorant, uh, looking at the data and challenging my own assumptions and saying there's a serious problem over here. There is a serious problem. You have to fix it. Okay. Now, the problem um, is as much women as it is men because mothers don't encourage their daughters to uh, become engineers and scientists just like fathers don't. You still have the wrong stereotypes. That needs to be fixed. Okay, it, has to start, it starts with, with mom and dad. Okay. And then it's a matter of women helping other women. That um, a lot of successful venture capitalists, some of them do. I mean, I don't want to generalize too much over here, but a lot of successful women don't uh, deliberately help other women because it's not the macho thing to do. They don't want to stand out in their own, in their own firms. They don't want to now be perceived to be women's livers and to have a bias against men. Women don't generally help women. It's changing. In fact, I wrote about that in the Washington Post three or four weeks ago, how, about the dramatic sh change I've seen in Silicon Valley with a bunch of groups. Um, you know, a, a lot of you are over here who are actively making a difference. The fact that you have this conference, we spoke here last year, it was on the table. Last year, were, I think there were about 90 people in the audience. Today, I'm told there are 300 people here. That's amazing how much it's changed. Attitudes are changing. There's an increasing awareness. Women are beginning to help each other. The lesson here is learn from the Indians. If my people can, can change things within one generation, so can you. It can, be, it can be fixed quite easily. We have to realize there's a problem. And we're not, um, no one's asking for affirmative action. Affirmative action can be destructive, especially in Silicon Valley. All we have to do is to acknowledge the problem and work on mentoring, work on, on, uh, on facilitating. In companies, in large companies in Cisco, on every hiring team, there should be a woman. The, you know, they shouldn't hire unless the person has the right qualifications. But there should be a woman on every, on every recruiting team. In venture capital firms, VCs should start going to Texas A&M. They should start going to women's colleges across the country and recruit their interns from there so that they're not all white boys that they meet. They also meet black women. They also meet uh, you know, Chinese uh, uh, middle-aged men. You know, it's a, a wide variety of people in these VC firms. So we need to change the stereotype, and it can be done, it can be fixed. Thank you. Um.